Oh, thank you very much. Uh, appreciate our host, and it's a wonderful to be here in uh, uh, Pakistan, and, and I appreciate the hospitality from our host and uh, being able to come to this wonderful country and to share in the experience here and uh, to our uh, noble uh, um, panel here. Uh, I'm going to be discussing a topic uh, which really is changing, and, and every day it continues to change with the volume of uh, uh, new medicines that are out, but it's something we have to deal with, and it's it's a real problem uh, for neurosurgeons that we face. Uh, a lot of the slides and information came from this book. It's uh, Chris Loftus uh, published this, and it's a, it's a very useful book. I recommend a lot of people get this. It's a, It talks and deals with a lot of anticoagulation and hemostasis in neurosurgery. Uh, unfortunately, the, the thing is that uh, the technology is changing so much that a lot of the, uh, these books need to be updated quite a bit. Uh, as we all know, bleeding is our enemy in, in neurosurgery and coagulation is our friend. These are general rules. Uh, about the only time we like uh, 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 thin blood is, our, uh, is uh, when we're doing bypass surgery. But we need to understand and deal with a lot of these uh, cases and, and the problems with the uh, with the hemostasis because we see patients all the time that have congenital uh, coagulation disorders. And a lot of these patients are on antiplatelet medications now uh, heparin, heparinoids, vitamin K antagonists, as well as the, the newer non-vitamin K oral anticoagulants that we're seeing being produced at a, at a, a monthly rate. I mean, the pharmaceutical companies are making new and new uh, blood thinners for the cardiologist for and with more specific indications. And, and to tell you the truth, it's very hard to keep up with it. It's 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 a ever-growing change. And uh, some of the terminology that you may see a little confusing at times is uh, for the non-vitamin uh, K oral anticoagulations, they, they kind of group them into a lot of these uh, different abbreviations. Um, I just put some of them on here. Uh, there it really hasn't been a true consensus on which, how we should uh, classify these. But we encounter every uh, patients in our practice every day that are on antiplatelets and anticoagulants. Uh, these are just a few of them. I mean, almost all our patients are taking some form of aspirin or Motrin or, and, uh, and then for various reasons, uh, for atrial fibrillation, prosthetic heart disease, DBTs, as well as for uh, the endovascular devices that are being placed on a daily basis. So, and we need to understand, you know, the, the, the patients that have hypercoagulable states as well as unknown therapy. I think there's a, a one thing we all oftentimes to forget to ask these patients too is about uh, herbal medications. There's a, especially in some developing countries and even in the United States, there's a, a large, uh, a uh, number of people in the population that take a lot of herbal medications for their health, and uh, they're, they're not without risk. Yeah, we're all familiar with the uh, ginkgo biloba, which is a very common herb that people take. It's a well-known uh, blood thinner, affects the vitamin K uh, coagulation factors. But in addition, common foods, ginger, ginseng, or all other herbs that affect the, the coagulation system, and, and we need to be familiar with those. Um, but the, we see that these medications are being produced every day. Just a quick summary. I mean, this, there's a lot of, this is a very busy slide, but the, the, the major factors and the major players when we talk about uh, the clotting cascade and, and thrombus formation are, we, ha we have the clotting factors here. And we all learn these in medical school with the, the various uh, factors, which uh, eventually go on to uh, stimulate prothrombin to thrombin. And that's one of the major players. We have fibrin, and then we have the platelets in addition to the uh, collagen in the walls of a blood vessel that, that's required the damage to the blood vessel, which starts the initial uh, cascade. So what we're going to be looking at is uh, how the newer medications are affecting the, the different players, how they're affecting the platelets, how they're affecting the clotting cascade, and, and also then the, the binding of, the, of these elements to uh, fibrin to, to eventually go on and form the thrombus that we like to have. Um, you know, that we, they can be divided up, the anticoagulants can be divided up into the parental and oral. And we're, we're all familiar with a lot of the, 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 the common ones with the heparins and heparinoids are used uh, uh, very frequently uh, in the hospital. And, uh, and then we have the oral ones for, uh, you know, traditionally warfarin was, you know, one of the most common ones, in addition to uh, some of the, the newer non-vitamin uh, K oral anticoagulants that we see here. And this list continues to grow and it, as they're 
they're developing more and more selective uh, inhibitors of the uh, uh, clotting cascade. As, and then this is just a general uh, quick summary of the slides. Again, you had your, your, your traditional vitamin K antagonist, the warfarin here, which affected a lot of the, the, the numerous uh, clotting factors, the, 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 the two, seven, uh, nine, and 10. But the newer um, uh, non-vitamin K oral anticoagulants, uh, they have now direct thrombin inhibitors, which affect uh, the uh, formation of, of the uh, thrombin formation, as well as uh, new uh, factor 10 inhibitors. And this list continues to grow. And uh, that's a very important uh, list of medications that we're seeing more and more. Uh, and thrombin is also very important because it plays an important factor in, in the plate linking via the GP23 uh, receptor. And so uh, when we inhibit that, it prevents the aggregation of, of uh, a lot of the platelets from occurring. Uh, this is a breakdown of some of the antiplatelet medications now. We had the old traditional aspirin, which was a COX-1 inhibitor, which, which basically uh, affected platelets, um, their activation, where these newer ones, the AD, uh, AD, ADP receptor inhibitors also affect uh, uh, receptor activation. Uh, I, I mean, the activation of the platelets so they don't become activated and, and don't uh, become adhesive. Uh, some of the uh, G23 uh, inhibitors, these affect more the receptor sites, the external receptor sites to prevent the binding or the aggregation of platelets. Because we're all familiar, we need, we need not only the platelets to come, but then they need to also be able to bind to the fibrinogen and to the collagen and attach to form the clot that's needed. And, uh, and then some of these others also are affecting different aspects uh, of, the, uh, of the platelets themselves. So as in this quick summary, you know, we need, we need the activation of these platelets to form the aggregation and to form the, the clot that's, that's needed here. I won't spend a long time on that. But uh, in summary, this is a kind of a summary of the kind of how the, all the newer uh, antiplatelet medications are working uh, on, the, on the, the, the platelet. This is a platelet here, and you have uh, the various uh, uh, P2I uh, antagonists here, which affect Again, these affect the activation of platelets. Uh, some of these others also are affecting the, uh, the direct antagonist to prevent thrombin from uh, attaching, which is also needed uh, for uh, activation of the platelets. Uh, you have re uh, receptor binders here that the GP23As are important uh, for, for preventing uh, aggregation uh, and preventing binding. We see that here so that the that platelets cannot bind to each other. So. Uh, they're, they're there, but they're, they're, they're not uh, binding. And then we're seeing new or other competitive inhibitors, which also prevent the uh, platelets from attaching to the collagen walls uh, on the damaged blood vessels. So there's a whole category of uh, new drugs that are being devised, uh, specifically uh, targeting different aspects of the platelets to prevent them either from not activating or from not being able to aggregate and attach or to even to attach to the collagen walls and, and form the clot. Uh, in summary, this is a nice summary. Again, it's really busy, but it's showing all the different mechanisms that are available. Um, point is not working, uh, but it uh, has the various things here. These are your original heparinoids and how they affect the thrombin, which is needed for activation and, and, and uh, uh, binding to the, uh, to the platelets. Uh, you have direct thrombin inhibitors that are now available. So the new categories are all the ones kind of in blue. These are the older heparinoids and where they are acting on the thrombin. We have aspirin, which was working internally with the COX ones, which prevented activation of the platelets. Uh, the, uh, these are uh, the anti-fibrinogen uh, and, and that prevent uh, aggregation and adhesions. Uh, again, these are ones, and these are probably the most common ones we're seeing now in the United States with uh, Clavix, and, the, and uh, they're the ones that uh, prevent the, the P2Y uh, receptor blockers, which prevent, the, again, they don't allow the platelet to activate to release its uh, uh, chemicals and stops the signal uh, from uh, being released in the biochemical mechanisms to uh, form and begin to aggregate. And then again, we have uh, uh, the other uh, DTEs, which affect, or the PDE, uh, inhibitors, which again also prevent the activation of the platelets. And so these are the, 
newer various categories. And like I said, they continue to grow in numbers. Um, so just wanted to do a quick summary so you understand why it's important to know what kind of medication the, the, the patient's taking because that's gonna determine how we're gonna reverse this when it comes down to surgery. Um, because we see bleeding occurring all the time on patients with, who have, are on antiplatelet or anticoagulation uh, medications. Uh, a lot of them are emergencies, uh, you know, the, either head trauma or, or tumors or acute discs uh, that require uh, um, surgery. Uh, the elective uh, surgery patient, and then we have surgery patients who de develop um, uh, that are on antiplatelets and needs to, but needs medications uh, or needs antiplatelet and anticoagulation, anticoagulation medicines postoperatively. So I'll uh, quickly move on to the, uh, we've all seen this patient, what do we do? The quick strategy is, is very simple here. You know, for antiplatelet medications, the, the main thing is platelets. You've got to give two packs of platelets, vitamin K. Uh, if, you, if it's a high-risk patient that's going to need to go to surgery, uh, two packs of platelets. DDAVP can also help the activation and release the, uh, of the platelets. Uh, and oftentimes it's recommended to continue this for every 12 hours for 48 hours if you're uh, on your post-surgical patients in addition to vitamin K. Um, these are some of the newer anticoagulation reversals. Uh, usually most of them like heparin and, and you can just stop or, uh, or just turn it off. Uh, otherwise you can give protamine. For Levinox, uh, you can uh, give the anoxaparin. It's a one-to-one -one, uh, protamine for it to um, anoxaparin. Warfarin, that's the traditional you're all familiar with. You give uh, vitamin K, uh, FFP if available, which most places do have. But then there's also the prothrombin complex concentrates, or it kind of takes the place of the old cryoprecipitates. And there's newer uh, our activated uh, factor sevens uh, that are available that work uh, very well, but they're very expensive and most hospitals don't carry them. And then for your non-vitamin K uh, oral anticoagulation, Again, it's the PCC, which is the prothrombin complex if available, or the activated uh, factor seven. There's others like uh, K-Centra and FIBA, which are, are really not specific, but they're activated prothrombin complexes, which uh, can activate the thrombin. And then we're seeing more and more selective for the uh, for direct thrombin inhibitors. We have uh, 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 Fraxabine, and also for the, the factor 10A inhibitors, we have uh, Adenex Alpha. So we're seeing more direct therapy um, uh, with these medications as they're becoming more selective. Uh, the, the pharmaceutical companies are also having to do specific antidotes. And in theory, this should uh, find that it should be easier to reverse these patients. And without having to give larger blood volumes, we'll be able to know exactly what anticoagulant they're on or, or what antiplatelet medication they're on, and then able to reverse it with its uh, uh, specific uh, uh, reversal. And then for elective surgery, I think it's always best to wait uh, five to seven days. Uh, for, and for our vitamin K antagonists, hold those for at least five days. And in my personal practice, I wait longer. I like seven to 10 days. Uh, the one problem with the uh, non-oral vitamin K inhibitors, even though the cardiologists and everybody, they say you can you know, wait two to three days or by three days you can um, do, it's safe to do surgery after they've stopped taking them. We just don't have any test or measure to know if, if those medications have really gone out of their system. So thank you. Thank <laughs> you.